Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first LinkedIn Live. Today, we're going to talk about the ROI of data lineage. If you're here, if you are a data professional, you probably have heard about data lineage before. But what are the actual use cases of this technology? I mean, what can you actually do with it? Because I guess probably you already seen some sort of diagrams using lineage. Um, and OK, looks cool. But what do you do with it? Okay, so here we have three guests with me today to talk about this. First of them, I'm going to say hi to Martin, that is my co-host here today, the CTO and co-founder of Alvin. How are you, man? Doing pretty good, thank you. A uh, quick introduction all on me before we go to our exciting uh, guests. Uh, Martin, uh, co-founder and CTO uh, of Alvin. Super excited to be here today. Uh, don't want to take too much spotlight now, at least in the intro from from our guests. So let's let's have them as well. Yeah, great. So we also got here Timmy, that is a data warehouse architect at Cry. How are you doing, man? Very good. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks uh, for having me on to have a chat with this delightfully. Uh, Great, thing. and the last guest is Boyan from Unity. He's a data science manager there. How are you doing, man? Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks for having me and thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, I mean, a quick intro. I'm working at Unity four years now, a part of a small data science and engineering team, around eight people. And data lineage is very dear and near to our heart, so so excited <laughs> to, to be part of this talk. Great. So first of all, to you that is here watching us, if you have questions, comments, you can just type them there. And once you start, you know, sending questions, I'm going to talk to the guests a little bit, and then I'm going to start reading from the middle to the end part of the live of the event. Okay. So, folks, I would like to make the first questions to you, which is, what is exactly data lineage, and what are the signs that you needed? Who wants to start answer this one? Maybe Boyan, that was the last one introduced. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's a hot topic these days, I guess. Um, for us or for me, data lineage is about observability and about discovery. Um, I guess like data catalogs, metadata, layers, data lineage. It's I just I count them all in the same spectrum, um, trying to tackle very similar uh, challenges. So if I have to sum it up in a very short uh, description, data lineage is a dependency graph plus metadata. Um, so kind of combining these two together creates a powerful way for you, for any data professionals to have a bit of understanding around how data flows between systems from the very much upstream role uh, data producers to very much downstream, hopefully data consumers, which is like, it could be anything to dashboards, models, applications, any, anything that, that kind of consumes that data. Very short. Okay. So does anybody want to add something to the definition of data lineage? Yeah, I think that's a pretty pretty decent definition of it. Um to me it it's you know, we're most of us are very, very familiar with DAGs and data lineage is you know just an extension of that, if even an extension at all. Um uh, what we probably are interested in talking about. And extending as far as is column level understanding, which is where it moves past what we'd be what we'd be used to. But it's a very similar thing. What comes from where, and, and where does it go, and uh, some of the stuff about that. Um. Okay, so I know that Boyan and Jamie have implemented in-house solutions uh, for data lineage in your companies. So before talking about specific details of uh, uh, implementing and the challenges involved in, in this. I'd like to understand how you guys realized that this is, was an, a need, that you needed to implement data lineage. What were the problems happening or the business problems you were trying to solve when you decided to do it? Um, yeah, I can I can chip in first. Um, <clears throat> so, so for me, it's a combination. Of, of things. So I, I have a kind of like past experience myself just working as a, as a, as an individual contributor. I've been using data lineage solutions before I joined Unity, so like five years ago. Um, and I, I've, I've been sold on kind of like how useful and how valuable it is uh, in the first place. And then 
I guess the second kind of like compounding factor is like once you reach a certain size of the, not only the team, but actually kind of like the data landscape, there is a threshold that once you reach that in terms of like how many raw data sources you have, some, how many processing steps you do, how many systems you integrate, like the way the data flows, it becomes unmanageable, so untraceable. And then once you start deploying things in production, you actually want to make sure that everything you have kind of scheduled and everything that is kind of upstream dependent to your, whatever you put in production, whether it's an application, a model, a dashboard, it's observable and you can monitor it and you can make sure that if something breaks, you're on top of it. Um, and then it becomes like the first thing that we did actually when we put one of our models in production is to draw that diagram manually because it spanned multiple DAGs, it spanned multiple jobs. So it, it, we ended up like three people drawing for an hour. It was like a huge thing in Miro that you, you have to zoom out and then zoom in. And then, it was like hundreds of nodes on that thing. So. So then we ask the question, so okay, now if, if a change happens in that pipeline, how you update that, right? You cannot just go manually update it. It's a, as a snapshot, it works fine, just to make an understanding. But then you have to have something that automates that and, and kind of provides you that out of the box. And then this was for us the tipping point, the tipping point where it kind of, we reached that threshold and we, we started investing in building. There was not many available alternatives in the market yet for kind of like off the shelf, just data lineage solution back, back then, at least I, I wasn't aware of something that we could use. So that's why. When, when was that, Boyan? It was 2019. Yeah. I'm curious on, on like some, uh, um, I realized I, I didn't really give my definition on, on data lineage. So I would like to just quickly kind of throw in, in kind of my, yeah, my please. Take that yeah. maybe it's a little bit different since, you know, when, when you're a provider, you, you kind of have a bit more abstract view of it. And I think, we kind of see it more as a, as a data set, uh, I guess, and and you know, like like Michael said, you can have column level, you can have table level, but it's that's more like almost like properties of the data set, like any other. It has quality, it has granularity, it has you know different attributes. So uh, and some you know some some things you can do yourself easily, some things are are, are more difficult to obtain, but. This data that can then be queried and used uh, to, you know, useful things, uh, as as we have already been been discussing to understand quality, uh, you know, different observability kind of observability is a bit of like a bag term, I guess, but mm -hmm. the different kind of use cases within within that. And um, I guess like what we say is also like about understanding how data is connected also across systems, and we kind of also see people as as a very important aspect uh, of this. So. It's not just about how the systems are connected, but, but it also comes to people. And that's where I have a question for, for you, Boyan, because you mentioned kind of it became un unmanageable and all of data streams. So to what aspect was, was you know, people and things like, let's say, security, was that not a driving factor? Or was that more like kind of nice to have? Well, we can do that as well. Yeah, very good, very good question. Um, so at that point of time, Kind of like the problem that we had was isolated, like easily isolatable. Like we didn't, as it was a model, we didn't re need to kind of like think more about the people aspect of in terms of like governor security access rights and so on. But but you are totally right that, that, that all these pieces in the graph, in the dependency graph, are uh, produced by by people and they need to be accessed by people. So actually, you can understand a lot about the collaboration in the team like how they kind of like flow naturally between the kind of like the different levels of aggregation and abstraction. And then you can actually also manage security and, 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 and governance. It just provides you a very easy way to, to kind of have this understanding because for each of these uh, kind of like nodes, you're going to have the, their, their kind of access rights and then they can propagate upstream or downstream. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good point. Yeah. But for us, it wasn't like a, a decisive in the beginning, but now it is actually. because. Yeah. I can, I think, I think based on Martin's question, I, it, a nice segue into why, why it became an important in Cree. Um, Cree is a, a Swedish med tech um, and as a consequence is a regulated, regulated industry. And um, there were serious enough um, security concerns about um, some things in terms of really putting patient first, which is one of the core concepts of, of the company. Um, and making sure we were doing the pos best possible thing for the, the patient's data while still having it workable. Um, and I might flit up and back a little bit here, but uh, I think that I have a point that already starts to relate to what Martin Martin said, and also this mural board concept, that we really saw, you know, we have 
things existing in our data pipelines and running around. But we want to drive our understanding of as much as we can from the code because everything that isn't the code goes out of date. So um, I guess we haven't all said it, but a lot of pipelines these days are either SQL or some Python scripts that are running in a, in a DAG and Airflow. But those are the only things that are true about the system. And every Miro board you put together is, is not true. Um, if you come in from a governance tool, you know you, you write your governance tool up and you have someone typing stuff in forever, that goes out of sync as well um, because it's not linked to the code, right? Um, and so we got this requirement that we needed to have really good audit logs um, on our data, uh, row level and column level. Actually, we said, let's do it as far as we can to the best quality. And we said row level and column level. Uh, we need to know who's able to access what and when and how. And, you know, some of the first things trotted out there was let's write up Let's write a let's write a document uh, or YAML with every column defined and who who can like an access level and then people get access levels, um, and everyone in the wider tech because there's a micro lots of microservices the microservice teams they had to write something up for for their database they had to write a YAML that said this column is that level of access, uh, and what we said in the data team is yeah we have a lot more nodes and we have interconnectivity. Um, let's let's take a scenario where um, from that other metadata we have um, that apparently that these that our engineering teams are going to maintain that this column is accessible only for doctors, let's say. Um, as that data moves through our pipeline, let's understand its inheritance and let let's let the security of this be inherited. If we use that column, all of a sudden anyone who uses that column anywhere they use it, we're upgrading that level of security to be the maximum level. And someone, in order to overwrite this, they have to, you know, mostly we have SQL pipelines, but in order to overwrite it, they have to go to the code and they mark above the code a comment to say, um, this is now being downgraded by this security level. Our GitHub has that logged. We know exactly who chose to, to downgrade it. We know when they were. And we can also trigger pull requests when lots of that is happening. Or sorry, not pull requests, but rather we can trigger review um, for the security, uh, for the security team or the um, legal team or the engineering team to kind of flag this. Okay, something's changed. Uh, permission levels. Um, so that was that's that was the real driving driving force for us. And we kind of said, let's go all the way and let's let's understand this as it as it moves around and let's sure make sure it it lives um, and it, it never goes out of sync. It's not even possible for this to to go out of sync. Um, and that was the that was the real driving force. It was not the only benefit when we really started jumping on doing it to this degree. Um, but that was the driving force. It was nice to have that driving force as well because it meant we definitely had the money to fix it because it was a core. Really, it's really interesting. It's like almost like the two opposites. Like at, at one end, we have re like the entire driving force was quality and. And essentially, you know, let's make sure that the pipelines are feeding good data into the ML models and, and all of that. And then on the other hand, it's like, it seems like security and access was the main kind of driving force for actually implementing that, this. And then, well, we need to propagate those rights uh, if data is moved and then kind of lineage be became a topic. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of a really interesting thing. And I think something that, that's important, right, that like regardless you know if you end up in lineage you shouldn't be like we need data lineage you should actually have like a really good driving use case that comes from somewhere and then lineage okay can help us solve those problems and then we have like our own almost opinion about how the lineage should work to help us solve this use case but we're not at least initially trying to solve everything between heaven and earth because obviously that's how projects kind of you know escalate and and, uh, and start slipping right so uh so, like, when, for instance, you, boy, and what you started, like, did you have, other than things are breaking, it's becoming unmanageable? Like, what signals within the company uh, or, or, you know, where, where did you start seeing kind of this surfacing? Was it from logs or, you know, uh, observe, like, uh, data dog and, and kind of reported errors? Or were it, like, users and people that were like, this is not working anymore? Yeah, very good question. Um, so, 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 kind of like the... 
For us, the the majority of the focus was on the on actually on the raw data, like whether the raw data counts in its shape and form, because we have a strict schema management kind of like very much upstream. We have a, a bunch of events, a lot of events coming in, uh, streamed. So so at some point, if a developer changes that schema, it hasn't been adapted on the schema management system, then a lot of these events was going to start piling in the data queue, right? So they're not going to be processed. So then this means that this row event suddenly kind of drops in volume. And then we wanted to make sure that we, we, we know this understanding and you know, how it propagates downstream, which exact pieces of our processing it, it affects mm-hmm. and how much. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so, so actually we can couple it with, with any monitoring uh, and testing tool like rate expectations. So the, um, mm-hmm. anything that is out there, Datadog, um, big, 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 big guy, we can, we can actually integrate it with the, with the lineage mm-hmm. And, and, and kind of build this understanding um, and, and, and have it not only consumable visually, but also uh, through notifications and alerts, because then you can just pile up, you can actually sum and, and have an understanding of the whole pipeline and build the statistics around that. Um, yeah. uh, but otherwise, we actually color the nodes right now with staleness as well. So this is actually something else that is important to quality. It's like, how fresh is the data? Like if a job fails uh, for, for whatever reason it is, we know that okay, this specific node is out of date, then everything downstream is out of date as well. So this is kind of like the two main drivers for us uh, around quality. That, that's really interesting because I think, and I can see how this is going to go. I'm going to be always on the other other side of this because, uh, um, like, observability was almost um, irrelevant, and and there's some interesting thing with well, I have a, I finished the sentence, which is that you know when we started looking at the lineage for the security purposes it gave us this new perspective on the whole thing we we're doing with data that from some perspective the lineage was all that there was and that there were pure functions changing things from one shape to another and we we would run the lineage or we worked with the lineage on a theory on this is theoretically this is all the code we have this is theoretically how this might exist and we would calculate and say hey wait a minute you can't make that change because when you make that change it won't be right anymore. Like this this has fundamental. We'd stop the whole process before it ever existed. So there, so much of it was about um, enforcing that the code told a true picture in itself, um, and it was very secondary uh, um, about uh, like observability. Although we ended up with some of the benefits you you've sort of mentioned, like this locking in, like we got to it or we were heading towards a stage. We are heading towards a stage where developers in disparate teams they go to touch something and their CI will will trigger a recalculation of the whole pipeline, which takes seconds because it's not touching anything. And then it says, hey, when you touch this, you're about to damage all this stuff. Um, you can't do that. Or you at least have to talk to someone um, about it. And yeah, because, because we're nothing to do with the observability uh, perspective because it, we're nothing to do with reality almost. We're, we're about the, the ideal. And the pure, and like I said, lineage gets you to think about inputs, outputs, almost functional behaviors, and they start to give you testability of your otherwise spaghetti code. It's almost like you are doing, uh, this is like static analysis uh, kind of version of of lineage, whereas uh, Uyan is more about like, I guess it's not dynamic analysis, but it's actually more like runtime, you know, getting, getting data and using that in a more streaming runtime fashion whereas you're doing this like static analysis ci cd uh, approach which is also uh, i guess yeah, well, quite different but really interesting to we, to we end up doing both but we come you see we come at it from like it's exactly like static analysis to be honest and we we have like some places where we've written down the types kind of explicitly and we don't talk to databases about that if those input types are wrong well things are screwed but those input types are fine hopefully. Um, But since we've come come from that approach, the system we've built can be enriched by the metadata, but it's not driven by the metadata. We're not, it's not logs that tell us how things connect. It's not the database that tells us it exists. Like we don't even, the database literally doesn't need to exist um, to have a picture and a schema and an understanding. And we can enrich this understanding with uh, the reality of the metadata and the observability. But the structure, um, the approach is slightly different just what what was the fundamental thing for us and that's obviously important in our case where essentially what we're doing is 
uh, I mentioned this thing of like inputs and outputs and you have a transformation. Well, we essentially said, oh, you're writing SQL to transform it. You're also writing SQL to transform the security level. You just put your, you're writing in there that we're, we're transforming the security level. That's essentially what you're writing. You're writing the function of the security. The function of the security is this person in this team chose that the security level goes down from being only a doctor to being any analyst can look at this. Um, and that is a, a function. It's not a reality exactly. Yeah. So f f before going to the next question, next question, I just would like to say that we got 60 people with the, with us here right now. Thanks everybody that is watching. This is our first LinkedIn Live. If you don't know Alvin, if you don't know me nor Martin nor any of our guests, follow us here, and we're gonna have more pretty soon. We also have some comments here on the uh, the comment section. I'm gonna start reading them soon. So. Keep going, keep sending us uh, uh, questions. And I also would like to know um, where are you guys watching us from? Where are you from, folks? That, uh, you, you that is there uh, watching us. So I would like to understand, folks, um, the challenges of building uh, data lineage on a in-house, as you guys did. Like, where do you even start doing that? Like, uh, what tools do you use? Uh, what are the, the main challenges uh, that you guys can share with us? Maybe I'll, I can take that. Lots of them, probably. By... <laughs> yeah, I I can take that maybe for uh, a, a second. Um, well, at least for us, considering how we were doing the journey, we were mostly concerned about being able to consume our very large SQL transformation base. Like most tran most of the transformations are being done somehow in SQL. How can we take this code that is the living representation of um, of what we want or what we understand in terms of lineage, how can we take that and, and break it out into its smallest uh, smallest parts? And what does that mean? It means how can we parse SQL and uh, understand it? So the biggest deal was uh, writing parsers is uh, is not easy, and they're, uh, they're they're not performant, and they're not not always designed. If you just take try and take something else um, to work exactly the way you want, so just everything around getting into uh, parsing, I guess, parsing. So that was for us the, the biggest deal. Yeah, I can I can definitely attest and relate to that. Uh, so also how we tackle it, we just uh, decided, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start small and then build up from there because there are multiple data sources, BigQuery, Snowflake, uh, you, you, you get to start from there. So we decided, okay, we're gonna start with GCP, we're gonna build the lineage there and then we're gonna see how we can generalize the parser and kind of like the, the onboarding to, to, to our lineage and then, and then take it from there. But actually, a bigger challenge for us not, was not a technical one, was actually how we convinced that there's a need for lineage in the first place. Because back in 2019, it wasn't like a, like a big thing. It wasn't discussed a lot. And, and we are, I consider us as, as a deployed data team. We sit with closely with business. So spending time building a lineage is not our kind of like core focus. Um, and then uh, we had a we have a central data team that is kind of like very busy with stuff. So so I've I've chatted with them about about the potential of building one uh, back in the days, and then didn't have the capacity to do so. So what we ended up doing is we decided okay we're gonna we're gonna start small, we're gonna build a prototype, and then we're gonna showcase like the potential of it because it's, it's very hard initially to kind of like demonstrate like how valuable this could be or mm -hmm. why we need it in the first place. If you are a, a small team, and then you have to deliver some models or, or applications in production. So for us, that was kind of like the, the biggest obstacle we had to overcome. So we actually ended up spending time outside of our working hours building that lineage because we didn't have the kind of official official uh, backlog to do so. Uh, but it ended up paying, paying off quite, quite well. And we actually have other teams right now onboarding to it and we are expanding kind of like the scope. And the more teams we have, the, the better, kind of the more the synergies of, of kind of working um, or having observability across systems and across teams and across uh, domains. Mm. Uh, I, I would bounce off of what was just uh, said there. We were, obviously we had the, the requirement in terms of security and it was a core business concern. However, it, you know, the suggestion from other, other parts of the company, you know, just people with their own Postgres database running a microservice, they, 
the majority of the rest of the development team wanted to just uh, brute force it, which I always think is a weird approach. Like, we'll just write it down. Like, okay, well, that doesn't sound very, very much like coding to me. But um, so we did, we got that, we at least had that excuse to, to get things through. But we were also blessed, I guess. Uh, coincidentally, we did a very large migration from Redshift to Snowflake. And for that project, I... I said, okay, we're, you know, we're also not going to do this by hand. We're going to use a parser to transpile this. We're going to, and nah. And also the approach there was um, we actually sort of uh, piggybacked off of uh, SQL Fluff, which is a linting, linting tool. Um, the guys are very helpful there. It's a very great tool. If you're not using it, you probably should be. Um, but what we were able to do is we, we, we went through these uh, jumps ensure that every bit of our code conforms and is lintable and passes the tests of SQL fluff. And that gets you a really good start because I'm sure Martin has the pain of every weird syntax under the sun has to be supported. Whereas we started with the linter, forced the syntax, it has to pass the linting. And then we added that, we, you know, we had this initial project of translate uh, Redshift to Snowflake, and then we were able to continue on uh, down the route. Uh, also, a great recommendation is uh, you can do cool things if you force your code to be uh, consistent, if you have that power, which Martin yeah. doesn't. Always. You know, exactly. <laughs> I think that's, you know, just, again, talking from the more generic perspective. Like, I think, you know, and anyone that's tried to build something, you know, would, would agree that building something generic is always harder than building something specific. And, and of course, if, if, you, if you're a company that have the resources and have the the mandate to, to build something like that and you also have you know power to define you know what are the edge cases we you know we're not going to have here what's the the conformance then if you have that knowledge then of course you can do a lot with just standardization and and almost you know uh, annotated driven lineage and, and development which which can be done uh, of course, uh, when you, when you don't have that, it's uh, it's a lot lot harder. Uh, I think like an interesting interesting perspective that you know we were doing a lot of POCs and, and and demos, and when customers kind of put in in data and they're using DBT, but they might not sync DBT immediately. One way that they'd be like, oh, this is this is working, is that they'll compare the table level lineage that we're providing just from the logs with their dbt models and that's like okay if this is legit then then you know we'll we'll continue or or, or we'll we'll buy the, buy the tool so but yeah certainly you know it's like you say actually parsing sql at scale and it's like a, a rabbit hole of um, of things to um, to do and i think like the the really the really thing to 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 think about is that like you can use a lot of of the shelf parsers and they will kind of take you somewhere but then then you know they might be too strict, or they might have these things where you might actually be better off doing a bit more lax parsing and 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 you know uh, kind of get most of it initially, and then and work on the, the the things that doesn't work later. So there's so many kind of things that I think differ when you try to solve things at scale for for multiple companies. But again, that's also why you know we think it's a valuable kind of thing to do to help companies not have to have to do this. Yeah. Um, so I just would like to say that, that I ask here um, who people, uh, where people uh, are watching us from. So we got a very international crowd here. We got people from Netherlands, Brazil, Colombia, Portugal, India. So thank you, folks. Thank you very much for being here with us. Keep sending questions. I'll read them in a few minutes. So you folks uh, develop in-house the linear solutions. Um, we already talked about the challenges, why you did it in the first place. And I'd like to know how long did it take and what are the results you're having? Like, what do you have now that you didn't have then when you started this, this project? Um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can try to answer. Um, it took us a while. Definitely, uh, but we we could we could actually have something up and running in in, in in a few months time. But again, as Martin said, like we didn't have to care about generalizability. Like we just we just wanted to solve a specific problem, and then we just focus on solving that first. And then we kind of like started to uh, uh, to worry about generalizability once we kind of hit a certain point. Uh, so for us, it was easy to kind of like to get going with just the graph and then simple visuals on top of that and start building. And expanding from there, uh, and the impact of it, uh, I guess the results. Few couple of years later, 
is that we we can uh, do things like, as I mentioned, like observe stillness. So be proactive when it comes to like stale pieces of the pipeline where something fall, breaks or doesn't process or some raw events doesn't uh, doesn't get processed as well on the on the upstream. So so this means monitoring and quality. Um, Another piece important for us is also collaboration within a team because we are like 40 plus people and, and different um, data professionals. Um, and we we'll, we we try to work as closely as possibly together and kind of share the, the same data foundation. So for us, the lineage provides us with enough understanding that we don't need to kind of ping each other every time we have a question or we want to discover that, uh, whether something exists, a table or a, or a column. Uh, we can we can we can use the lineage to first discover and then validate. Uh, I guess that's that's the observ observability provides this this context because uh, with the lineage we provide a lot of metadata. We provide like what is the code that generates that that asset, uh, what is the kind of like column description, table description. So we 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 pull a lot of metadata from BigQuery, from Airflow, from the code repo, activity history. So we know what generates that, how it's scheduled, who uses it, how it's used. And then this means that once you discover an asset, you can actually make a decision, can I use it or not? Can I branch off? Can I, can I build on top of this or not? And, and that for us is key because collaboration increases efficiencies and, 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 and cuts uh, processing costs because you don't need to kind of duplicate pipelines. Um, and we have a lot of ambitions of actually how we are act to automate some of these things. So you don't need to consume this uh, in the lineage itself, on the visuals, but it, we actually get notifications and summaries of unused assets or stale assets and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I think that sort of uh, your answer uh, uh, answers the uh, Daniel's questions. He was asking about how does data lineage help ensure data accuracy and traceability in an organization? I, get, I, I think it's sort of what you said, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I can take the, the both questions at, at once. Uh, following on from that. So, I mean, for us, it probably took uh, two two months, maybe, um, for, for whatever we had, uh, or whatever we came out of it, two months, I think. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, stuff has to be continuously uh, expanded, so it's very hard to, like, infinite, if you want to answer a different way, but, like, two months to have a, something that was usable by, um, that was really providing, starting to provide value and, and really expanding past the initial value. So I've mentioned a few times why we why we started it, but the use cases exploded immediately. Um, and definitely the use cases are related to, again, something Martin would know well about, the better you can parse the SQL and the less, you know, you can start out doing something really simple, like some regexes and stuff. If you only care about tables, you can get away with that. But um, doing it in a serious way and having a better quality output from from that lineage really blows up the amount of opportunities you have. Um, obviously, well, not obviously, but we we immediately had solved the problem of lineage, and we have like I don't know, thousand thousand two hundred uh, SQL scripts spinning around, and all of a sudden they're self-documenting in terms of security. And we did it in in the end when you add up all the time, we did it in significantly less time than it took other dev teams to write it down by hand. You know. I mean, that should be kind of obvious, but well, it's not necessarily obvious that sometimes brute forcing it can be faster. But that was only the first of the things. What we got past, what we got after that, um, that I think was uh, really relevant is massive improvements on uh, CI, CD, um, and testing. So I uh, don't know how lots of people, testing is obviously a big topic in the, in the industry. I, I still think it's a confusing one um, in general, but one of the big deals we found is how to accurately test a lot of stuff you really have to go to the data uh, a lot of the time right and we still have to go to the data but going to the data is costly and it, it it takes a while to even boot up something where you can test reasonable data right so what we found is by having this lineage this lineage that's only functional we were able to take our pull request going through github actions parse the imaginary new tree, generate a representation of the new tree, and fail, fail fast. And we're talking about 30 seconds. So in 30 seconds, we can say, no, you're taking away a column that something else is trying to point at. That's not okay, right? Um, and that, that means tons of not running Snowflake clones, tons of not creating extra permissions, tons of not running queries that 
don't need to be run or couldn't possibly have failed. So we still have to do that step at the end. But now only there's a whole set of problems that don't exist anymore. And I'd, I'd advise to people really highly, again, going back to SQL Fluff, SQL Fluff, which costs nothing in a package to install, having that gets rid of that comma error, error which people, guys, you probably know when you're deploying and you have, you have someone left out a comma because the last step of moving it up and back, you, you lost the comma somewhere. It's disastrous when you pay to duplicate a machine and wait 15 minutes uh, to run something, only to find there's a comma missing. That kind of error will be completely cut out by SQL fluff. But then the next layer of error, the error that talks about the system as a whole, the whole pipeline, the functions of all inputs and outputs, we cut all those out as well um, afterwards. And I, a few more like benefits on the CI uh, CD that we ended up having as well is um, that we were able to extend the tooling to our stakeholders who were giving us inputs. You know, all the developers were often complaining about, oh, I don't know why they love to talk about it so much, but they're like, oh, well, we can't drop or move a column and it'll destroy something. I don't think that's the biggest deal in the entire world. Normally, it's a lot more recoverable than them putting in low quality values. But um, they were able to integrate with their pipelines failing. They would essentially get a trigger that they couldn't possibly, like that there was a contract. You couldn't do that because we we uh, we would be broken if they removed that, remove that column. And I think what's really important about that is all of that is without human interaction. No conversations going on. A PR comes back and fails and someone goes, okay, well, now I have to do something about this and, and, and understand that. So everything around uh, the developer experience was, was a massive, and, and CI, CD was a massive benefit. And then I guess the last thing that we found, which also was mentioned a little bit by, by Boyan there, is um, we, we said, okay, we have this cool graph. And everyone was always asking to see a graph. Oh, every new joiner, we, we have a really diverse uh, team in terms of different skill levels and analysts who are touching that data, but um, uh, maybe aren't, they're not engineers, they're, you know, they're not writing Python or anything, they're writing some SQL, but they're still able to touch all these um, different aspects. They were always asking for a graph. We presented the graph and they thought it was cool, but then we immediately realized we could go one step further and we have a data catalog and they would search for uh, a column. They wouldn't need a graph because what they cared about was that column and understanding every process that had happened. Like it was this case statement at this step and then this case statement at that step and it went through this step at that. That's what they cared about. They didn't care about looking at a giant graph. They wanted to understand, oh, this is eventually coming from Salesforce. Like by, and they wanted to see how the, they wanted to see, oh, we introduced, this is unusual that we're dividing here in step five. And they didn't want, they didn't want to understand that by clicking on nodes and opening things up. They just wanted to see that laid out. And uh, they were able to do that. And similarly, uh, because we brought in this concept of writing documentation above the column, we were able to have kind of, well, documentation's written in the SQL, so it doesn't, okay, goes out of date a little bit, but it doesn't go out of date like writing documentation in a documentation tool. Um, so yeah, we saw a huge, in terms of onboarding and new joiners and barrier to entry, we saw so much less failure, so much more. We had, in our main repository, we had a four-fold increase in the number of uh, merged commits starting wow. the month after. Yeah, and... Um, analysts suddenly didn't have to ask anybody about anything you know it, it, it put the good the good guardrails on that meant communication wasn't necessary to i often say it's really nice to build systems where people can accidentally do things right and uh, having this really accurate lineage just let everyone accidentally do things correctly yeah, yeah so um one of the tools that, uh, and it's not one, but some tools that you folks mentioned it earlier in the conversation, like GBT and Airflow, they do have some level of lineage there. And why, why, why the lineage is like not enough? Uh, I mean, is it enough? Uh, I would like to understand. Because um, here at Alvin, one of the things that we brag about is that we, we build uh, lineage at an automated column level. And I'd like to, to understand the differences between them. Like, uh, I don't know. I think you folks can talk more about because I was going to try to explain here and you can start talking. Well, maybe I can hit, hit it off because I also had some kind of questions for, for Michael, actually. But um, it, it kind of relates a little bit because when you look at, I mean, 
you could almost argue that uh, Michael kind of built like a security oriented DBT tool. Like there's YAML, there's metadata, there's, I mean, there is some, uh, some similarities, I guess, with a tool like, um, I mean, maybe he will, uh, you know, be super upset with me saying, but there's obviously overlaps, I guess, with, with what DBT is doing and, and what they did in terms of having uh, annotation driven um, kind of outside of the warehouse kind of way of, of building the, the data models and, um, uh, and the columns. And, I think, you know, similarly also, like Airflow is a bit different since it's more about any generic type of uh, type of workflow. Uh, but if you look at a tool like DBT or something that is annotation uh, or, or metadata driven in, in this case, and the metadata actually generates the tables, it's not something you extract kind of after. And I think that is, is a big difference. But so the advantage is obviously that you you get the lineage and you get the absolutely correct uh, lineage. I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, and this goes more into what Boyan is saying, is that, well, actually, this data is connected to tons of different places. And, and the moment that you have usage that falls outside, because I think that's, that's like the hard part where, well, suddenly someone creates a table here, like they have permissions to do so. So they create a table uh, that lives outside of, you know, uh, DBT or it lives outside of this like annotation kind of driven uh, flow, then suddenly what, what do you do with that? Then, you know, it's almost like it's invisible uh, to you. And, and, and if there's sensitive data going, going into this, then, then what do you do with that? Or if there's some like, you know, tools that might even be connected to, to those tables. So I think that that's where, you know, I would make quite strongly the case that, um, uh, when you look outside of being a developer and the workflow, like all, all of that, where you have like a great benefit and, and speed, I think there's certainly cases where if you look at the bigger kind of picture, uh, especially when it comes to auditing and, and quality, uh, I, I, I personally think that it, it's not enough. You kind of need uh, need the full coverage and you need to, you know, like Boyan has done, you actually need to instrument uh, all the all the systems, all the tools uh, and extract the lineage. And I'm not saying like, you know, either is right or wrong, uh, but it's more about uh, kind of what you try to achieve, right? Uh, do you wish to achieve like the full picture uh, of everything? Do you wish to achieve obs observability and discoverability? Then then obviously DBT and airflow lineage is not enough. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to improve a certain part that might be more problematic in a prioritized way, uh, then, you know, DBT can give you, um, uh, give you those uh, things. But I was just like curious, like to, to yeah. Michael, if you did have, you know, was that like actually prevented completely or could you have the cases where people would, you know, create data that lived outside of this, uh, uh, this flow yeah. and, and is that like flagged in some way or? I would, I would say, um, I would say that it's the same thing from different uh, directions. The, the core principle, it was about uh, the code driving um, pipelines, but as I as I kind of mentioned, yeah, we had stuff that would scan the metadata and put that in. So we just had a generalized, a, we had a kind of parser unit, and we had a, a generalized, um, a generalized input of saying, "Hey, here's an edge." And uh, okay, we're talking about graphs here. Maybe this is jumping too far, but like here is the, here's here's this job or the SQL that's running, and it's this one is replacing the previous one. So we were able to populate that because the input was generic enough, but it came. The most important input was often the was often the code without the database, and that perspective changed a lot of what we were doing. And we actually did something that I thought was pretty clever, at least, which is um, we we would render the big the DAG um, kind of representation via whatever metadata you wanted to fill it up with, and then we had this kind of endpoint where we would kind of soft clone that DAG and make alterations in it by by any means that we kind of kind of wanted. So what that what that allowed was um yeah what allowed that allowed was the the ci cd sort of stuff um and it also allowed to sometimes sometimes you could have an inconsistency because that means sometimes inconsistencies come in and you could look at whether whether or not and how you want to resolve that i i think i wandered off a little bit there but basically we still were able to and are able to consume like scan the database once in a while and and throw in the database's opinion about all the meta information or uh, throw in uh, specific jobs from different places. Uh, I think going back to the DBT thing as well, I, 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 uh, I'm, uh, we are not using DBT internally, and that is probably one of the reasons why we went this went this route. And I think DBT is qu 
quite intrusive compared to what we com- compared to what we have. So, you know, it wasn't annotation driven in pen. I, I don't know if I would call it the same as the way DBT is doing stuff. DBT again, sometimes it matters where you decided what what you cared about when you started building product. That makes a big difference to what you end up with. And DBT cared about building a DAG, which to be honest, you don't. If you have if you parse the SQL, there is a relationship written in the SQL. So you didn't need the you didn't need DBT to do it. But that that was their primary concern. And then they just they actually don't know anything about the SQL there. They they don't have any knowledge of what's going on, uh, which is completely different from the approach of parsing the SQL. Um, so it's quite fundamentally different there. I don't know if I answered that question at all. But there you go. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Want to say something, Martin? Before I uh, jump. To... No, no, no. I think I think he, uh, you know, he always go, goes uh, quite deep into the matter. So. Yeah, I think <laughs> So yeah, so we got a lot of questions here from our our folks. So I'm gonna start reading them. If you are, if you wanna ask something, just send there in the on, in, in the in the chat, and we're not gonna leave here until we answer them all. So we got one here from Janagan or Yanagan. Uh, hi, how can bigger companies with rigid data governance frameworks tackle intro and implementation to data lineage and a new data metadata strategy? Oh, that's a tough one. Just, just do it. Get, get, get the money. Get legal. Get legal to come in and, uh, and do it. I think, I think this is kind of a question that um, that actually is not really a technical one. This ties more into like what we said. It's a cultural one. Like you have politics, you have buy-in, you have procurement, you have someone has championed this huge tool and and you know now we're stuck with it and it's like a loss of prestige if if that suddenly should. Uh, kind of go go outside uh, or like if you know if it should stop using it or throw it away um, and maybe there's like a five-year lock-in or, or you know so I think that is a bit how enterprise sales work uh, works at time but what I would say is that a lot of the you know frameworks you know like Alvin open source frameworks like they're usually super easy to set up and it takes very little effort to, to get it started so I think what we see is that you know if there's a uh, almost like a bottom up approach where someone like sees the need for it and you can you know you know pending that you you actually have the permission to set up the tools and and access the data it's usually super quick to you know do do a poc or try to understand if this tool can be valuable and i think it i think many people would be shocked to see you know how far you know uh, you know tools like like alvin uh, you know uh, other other uh, closed source uh, proprietary or open source tools have come compared to, you know, a, a big legacy enterprise uh, enterprise product that would solve most of the problems with, with you know, not that uh, two week uh, kind of uh, intro course to the product and and an army of consultants to, to implement it uh, and, and and all that kind of follows with that. I, I would also throw in something there apart from my joke answer in the beginning is. Um, I think there's there's two things that are quite important uh, about this, and you know, I can't help but kind of comment that maybe something like Alvin is is really the better idea here. Is you want to get your foot in the door, and you want it to unintrusively work. You want it to to boot up, and you you go to somebody when you go to somebody and you say, "Hey, I, I wasted uh, you know three weeks." They start to get angry, and then you say, "And I have everything perfect," and then they're all then they don't care anymore. You know, <laughs> so that's that's the thing if the tool you're trying to implement logs along and and half works i mean we probably are all in an industry where we talk about data warehouse failure that's what you know kimball was talking about this all the time you would also you also have data lineage failure like if you try and introduce it badly uh it's not gonna work if you introduce it fully with ma- massive amount of stuff going on then you get then you get the benefits and they come through um and I don't know, we, we were lucky enough to invest enough time that uh, we kind of hid away and then we, we came out and people were like, whoa. <laughs> and so I think I think also like I would kind of like, like to add uh, one, one more thing that I think is also equally important here is that I think it's important, you know, especially it's more about, you know, maybe it's about the question is about like, you know, how do you sell to the to the leadership and, and the C-suite? I think it's also about really, you know, putting this in a package that, Kind of makes sense and and that you can really 
quantify you know the value of introducing these these things and 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 you know in one of the one of the things that uh, that we think is very exciting when it comes to lineage usage and analyzing as we said lineage as, as a data set is that you can actually understand like you know what are we actually spending on generating this data who, who are using it you know almost like what's the waste that we that we that we have in in our data warehouse spend so suddenly it's not really a question about you know we should start using data lineage some abstract term from you know the dictionary it's like we can actually cut 30 percent of our dbt costs uh, yeah. because we can analyze the, analyze the the dag we can analyze the usage and uh, essentially impact of this data and I think so. It's almost like you know, if you can create a powerful narrative uh, around lineage and metadata, uh, not that some like boring tool that is you know everyone hates. Uh, I think that is the the real power. And I think I think um, yeah, we are. I mean, we are obviously working on some really 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 cool stuff uh, stuff there as well. So you know, I I personally very excited about cost, and I think certainly you know in the in the in the current uh, environment, as you know, everyone is, is saying, I think it's even more, even more relevant as, as data teams are kind of coming to, you know, how do they prove their value? You know, are they just a bloated kind of uh, uh, team that, you know, what, what are they really, really doing? But curious to hear kind of, you know, Julian take, take on this, that he's kind of almost lived through this process a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So to build upon, uh, yeah, I just wanted, yeah, maybe just add a short, uh, very short follow-up as well. Um, yeah, I think like identifying the gap and then just building a POC and then kind of apologize later is might be the best approach here. And then as, as Martin mentioned, like cost yeah. optimization usually is the universal language uh, of, 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 of bigger companies. So if you identify the, the use case, then... There's tons for cost as well, as, as, as Martin said, like... You know, we are finding stuff that's just hanging around or being run for no reason. But I, I also have harped on a huge amount about how much developer time it saved, how much cheaper each hire is. We don't need someone as good. They can focus when they come in as an analyst. They don't have to go an engineer by accident. They can they can do their stuff, you know. Um, so there's tons of things to do with cost, both in terms of uh, productivity and in terms of um just literal cost of 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 producing producing stuff um and i like yeah i mean that's I, I see one question on the side which i think is kind of funny here and and interesting it's like well, does anyone care about a giant graph i think uh i i totally agree with that like we 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 rendered it and then we said this is i mean dbt which has very little information is completely cluttered and irrelevant like so but but that graph what's behind that when you get past that is the ability to say well that's a single point of failure or what we are moving towards as well, uh, which I think is really exciting is, um, it's like architectural linting. Like fundamentally we kind of hit the PR and it says, Hey, you're, you're kind of putting two fact tables together. That's not really what we do. We don't do that. Pat that's not a pattern. We don't do that. You, you shouldn't be working with these things or uh, we're nowhere near this, but, um, something along the lines of, Hey, this is the same granularity and joins as something else. Why would you do this? So, um, and what powers that is a huge graph, but you don't need to see it. You just get the, you get the answer. Um, or as I said, I mean, you look up the, you look up the, a column and you just get the definition all the way back without having to unwind things. We're just so used to like, it, the first improvement seems like a graph. I don't know why everyone asks for it, but as soon as you have the next thing, you never need the graph again. Um, I think the the graph is it's, uh, driven by by I think demo. Uh, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Very much is, but, uh, seeing is believing. Exactly. I think we are as we are visual um, um, animals. I think like our sense is like a, a visual cue sense is just the most powerful one. So visualizing is the way to kind of like showcase what it what it does because it's otherwise this is kind of like abstract thing that is people might not relate to it. So sometimes taking the extra step to visualize, it makes sense, but but I totally agree the graph itself is not that relevant. You can make it useful, you can make it interactive, you can zoom in, delete, add, take a snapshot, like to, to, if you want to put it in a slides or, or kind of like document something, but but yeah, I, I also agree that the graph by itself is just a byproduct of what actually matters in this kind of like the, the you know, it's, a, it's, kind, it's kind of like It's kind of like asking as well, um, you know, what what's the use in seeing Google Street View? There's just so many streets. Yeah, it's because you can also ask Google yeah. to get you from A to B because the streets exist. <laughs> That's a very good, very good analogy. Yeah, it's actually funny that there was this uh, 
uh, I always forget his name, but uh, this guy that wrote a really good piece on like the layers of lineage and, and kind of compare data lineage to, to Google Maps and the different layers of granularity and this like, you know, big picture versus the ability to zoom in like 100,000 times and, and get exactly what, what, what you want. And it all has, I think like definition of value, like it all has value in some some sense, like maybe seeing the lineage is what creates initial trust that this is, you know, this reflects the world or the process as I as I understand it. But when it comes to the value it adds in an ongoing basis, that's more the operational, like the CICD, the quality, the observability. But they're all like necessary parts of the of the journey uh, to to some extent. Okay. And actually, I can as kind of like a data scientist myself, I can answer the second part of that question. Uh, so, what is the ROI for consumers of data analytics or AI and ML? I think, well, for me, the ROI is, 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 is insane. So first, it gives me the ability to, to make sure that the quality of the data that fits into the modeling and fits into the application is the right amount of kind of the right level of quality, that there is nothing that breaks uh, down uh, upstream, that is discovered uh, downstream. I think the trust, uh, the data trust is a very fragile thing. Once you break it, there is a very hard uh, path to recovering it. So, so ensuring that quality is, is, is always 100% is essential. And the other uh, big piece is that now we can utilize a lot of data from a lot of sources. So AI, ML, they are kind of like data centric. We know all, already know that it's not about improving the models, it's improving the input. So the more high quality data you have, the better the models and the output you can generate. So being able to actually consolidate and combine a lot of sources for us is essential. We don't have the time to build all those pipelines, but actually we piggyback on a lot of pipelines built up by our colleagues, product analysts, people who have more domain knowledge than we do. We actually we can utilize, we can combine all these data sources now that we have the lineage that gives us the, the discovery and also like the, uh, the observability. So as, as, uh, as it was mentioned before, we don't need to reach out to people to ask, oh, what is this, what is that? Uh, can we use it, can we not? We can get the answers right away ourselves. That's a really, really, uh, really good point. I, I think I can't, can't, we can't get through a, a data talk without irrelevantly throwing in data mesh somewhere. But like this is a, <laughs> I, I don't really believe in data mesh uh, myself, but like if we're going to go there, if we're going to do something like that, if everyone wants to talk about microservice data, you need to know where all of it goes and where all of it comes from. And you can start to talk about uh I think one of the problems with data mesh is that there's no borders, really. That's the whole point of having data. You kind of put everything together. That's the point, right? But what you can do is, and, and we started to kind of do, like you're talking about, is you're, 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 the, you're the engineering, you're the uh, ML team, and you're like, we like the way this data looks. It looks kind of okay. Let's start using it. What we can do, what, what you can do by making that choice and us being able to see it is you can say, increase the relevance of that pipeline. We can have proper feedback loops of the data engineering wakes up you know, a week in a morning and they realize, oh, this pipeline that used to be irrelevant is all of a sudden critical. And and I can start to treat it with that respect because we all have pipelines that somebody's going to point at us if it's if it's down. And we all have other ones where, you know, we, we finish out the year in December and think, I can't believe that's been broken for four months. I didn't notice. Like there, there are pipelines that can get away with being completely down because they're not relevant. But being able to kind of actually give that feedback, being able to say, okay, well, all of a sudden, this is one of our SLAs, and being able to do that without having to come talk to us and and be uncertain about you know will this go up or down? No, you just give the, the kind of natural selection feedback to that pipeline, and the tool starts to inform you. Yeah, you can't let this one down anymore. Great. So I just uh, shared on the chat the uh, article that uh, Marty mentioned it, the many layers of data lineage, which is a uh, very interesting one. And also, I put the link to anyone that wants to give Alvin a trial. So there's a link there to anyone that wants to try the tool in your company. So yeah, let's get another question here. Um, there was this one from Enhiki. Uh, how to build a data, oh, sorry, and, and how to build, build an auto-updatable strategy is there any tools or recommendations for a data lake already on production with several sources? Mm, I don't understand the question. I think. Do you guys? Yeah, I think it's talking about maybe um, building a data lineage uh, solutioning house. I don't know. 
don't know. What does auto updatable strategy mean? I never heard that term. <laughs> yeah. Not sure. If you can, if you're there yet, then he can. You can um, ask again. We will be happy to answer you. Yeah. So, Daniel is back. In a in a period that we're talking about data privacy, what are the protocols for data security over this pipeline? Is some SOC two approach being used in favor of this? Is that a question for me? Mm, I don't so, know. To anyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, let me see. It's on data security. Yeah, um, I mean, the protocols were sitting down with the legal team and going through the legal consequences of, of working in Europe with some GDPR and, and SHREMS uh, responsibilities. And we laid out a sort of very granular um, definition of um, different access patterns based on type, like this is PII2 and I mean, that would be something we're all kind of familiar with, but we went a lot more granular so that we had like things w worse than PII2 and, and better than them. Um, and then we, we kind of built a matrix where there was a second dimension relating to uh, the producer. So there's a lot of bad stuff, you know, if, if the data is produced, for us at least, if the data is produced in France, it's not everyone that can use it because it, the people in France can use it and certain, for certain purposes it can be used um, in, in other circumstances. I mean, it was really an ongoing uh, discussion with um, the quite large legal team, primarily the legal team, about what we what we needed to do. And it, it was interesting. I mean, it seemed like the Wild West to me because they were constantly going up and back to the government and being like, is this okay? And the government was like, we, well, we, we don't know. <laughs> but but I think you're kind of making a good point here is that I think uh, may, maybe this is a good opportunity to kind of, you know, be very clear about this, that I think a lot of people that you know work in data or in tech, um, you hear GDPR, you hear SOC 2, and I think you automatically assume that these are super technical uh, requirements or, or something that's almost like is enforced in code or that there actually is like an instruction to specify exactly how to implement it. And if you think that, then like, please don't think that this is... You know, you can almost think that these things are in place to help lawyers and legal firms uh, make money. Like these are, you know, a lot about making using common sense and ensuring that you have, you know, protocols in place to, you know, uh, like, you know, follow the, the regulations properly. And mm -hmm. this is something that, you know, so takes a lot of time. And, and, and like Michael say, sometimes, you know, the auditor doesn't even know what's right or wrong and they don't they don't really have the technical knowledge either so this is why it's it's very hard to you know sometimes you, you might not even know if you are fully compliant or not or you might think so and then the auditor comes and and, and you know says that these these things needs to change so it's um yeah i don't know if you any like perspectives on this as well okay. but it's a very you know challenging topic due to as technologists you want this to be like mm -hmm binary but it's like more yeah, fluid. Yeah. yeah um i just have one small thought that's directly at the top of my head um which i'll i'll, I'll pop out one thing we noticed like we were driven to this project by shrems too which is not as well known as um uh, gdpr but uh, it's an extension of that but neither pretty much nobody's been prosecuted or even really heavily approached about gdpr stuff in europe was my understanding from the legal team so there's no precedent for a lot of this stuff and we were preemptively trying to do our absolute best for our customers and our patients by really being at the forefront of the shrems 2 thing which was even more on the front um and you know there was huge effort put into it but a lot of it also comes right down to is it absolutely evident that we're doing our absolute best you know because i mean you think you get very scared about the law and the government sometimes but in the end if you're doing your absolute i mean i don't i'm not a lawyer but <laughs> my impression is you're doing your you're doing your absolute best yeah. and you're, you're putting a ton of effort into this you'll probably get a warning and a chance to, to 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 fix and improve on this stuff and um sometimes that's all we can do anyway um and i i don't know i've talked to lots of huge companies who they all it all it always seems like they know what they're talking about but that's what it often comes back down to um but sorry Brian, uh do you have anything to add because I, I cut off your your intro from martin <laughs> no 
No, actually, I, yeah, I, I think you guys covered it quite well. Okay, so we got one more question here from Nayara. I think this was uh, to Boyan. Um, she's asking, what was the main reason to migrate from Redshift to Snowflake? I guess, I guess that was me. When... Yeah, it was you yeah, yeah. telling the story. Yeah, It was me. I guess it's not going to be a surprise considering what I talked about. It was security. Uh, Redshift is... Uh, Amazon's never going to hire me uh, after this, but uh, Redshift's getting old, uh, to be honest. Um, and there's some really interesting things that it's 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 missing. Uh, I don't know if you guys have come across this or, or know about this, but like one of the biggest things is um, we we live in a world where you're a lot of tables you're dropping and recreating them. A lot of for a lot of tables that's fine. Right? For a lot of your assets, it's it's fine to like fully reprocess stuff. Not everything, you know, not your event stream. I assume uh, that under no circumstances can be dropped and recreated. But um, Redshift doesn't uh, really have a good way of um, Managing security when you're when you're doing that sort of stuff. There's, the super user is just way too powerful, and it's very hard to get a more granular. Um, it's very hard to work without the super user, and it's uh, it, it's way too. It just has unlimited access. So that was a big that was a big deal for us. So it was, everything was about security, performant encryption, uh, column level access, and just more sensible modern approach to uh, to things. That was the pretty much one and only driver. I've been asked that a good few times. Yeah. It was a good opportunity as well. When uh, when legal and security were behind us, it was a good opportunity to fix everything. Like we we tore tore everything down and put everything back up better. Which is a we had a question a while ago about how do you how do you get stuff doing? You also have to watch for those opportunities when security or or legal or finance are coming to you with a problem. Sometimes maybe you can sneak in the side of your solution as well you know you want lineage and you know that maybe this would be helpful for that 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 problem although there's some other hat where you could do something simple i don't know um but, but doing the the bigger bigger project that's really going to solve the wider thing sometimes slipping that in when the business clearly has need and revenue for doing stuff not that i did that i only did that the the the, 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 the total total bit above required in order to get a, a good result <laughs> Yeah. So um, it's been an hour that we're here. It, it was fast, right? So we couldn't even uh, uh, talk about uh, the most deep stuff. But I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, it was really, really fun. I, I really enjoyed it. This is our first LinkedIn Live. We got a good amount of people with he, with us here. I really, really enjoyed your everybody everybody's questions and engagement. Um, we're going to have to wrap up because, you know, we're going to more work and meetings. Want to say something, Martin? You just opened your mic. Uh, no? no? OK. So thank you very much, folks. We're going to have more LinkedIn Lives here. I just uh, shared uh, links to our newsletter, to our Slack community, to anyone that want to join and maybe uh, uh, ask more questions to, to Martin or to me there. And yeah, also, yeah. there's a link. Sorry? Yeah, maybe, maybe just like add finally that we like uh, I guess we had like a couple of more things that we would want want to discuss. So you know, if there's any additional thoughts on that, uh, you know, in, in the comments after, like the I think the you know as we now have like one tool here that is uh, you know buy it, and then we have some kind of that have built it themselves. I think that's one thing that we were wanting to get a bit into. You know, this great build versus buy debate. You know, oh. as the last couple of years also has had. A huge amount of open source tools and also is a more relevant discussion but we will not do that now but i think that's um, something that you know feel free to continue that in the, in the comments yeah okay. yeah maybe we can have an event only to discuss that right like when it's it's a big, uh, it's, it's a it's an ongoing we can we, we can finish that up and then we can start on etl versus elt and then <laughs> what, yeah. what are the other five we could do that, that everyone talks about the whole time like we could just go in a circle <laughs> And then I can just, mm, yeah. I can, we can have like, you know, that uh, Harry Potter uh, video from way back where the, they had the puppets and the, the guy yeah. goes, Dumbledore, Dumbledore. I, I could just, I could just say, data mesh, data mesh, you know, throw, <laughs> throw it in there to make, a, to make a word, complete word salad. Yeah. yeah so thank you very much, folks. And I uh, see you soon, hopefully, right? So, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.